Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. The Onyx Hunt app is your premier GPS mapping service for your phone, for your tablet, your computer, whatever it is, they all link together through the Onyx Hunt app. And one of the features that I like the most um, is being able to switch back and forth between the aerial imagery, hybrid imagery, as well as just your typical topographical layers. And what I mean by that, so you can switch from being able to see just the, the topo lines in your traditional topo map, then you could put it to just a straight aerial view as a like a bird's eye view of the terrain you're looking at. Or my personal favorite is the hybrid, which combines the topographical layers and the aerial imagery that can be really helpful uh, you know, for hunting any species, but specifically when it comes to hunting whitetails. You know, you're able to, I talk a lot about finding where the terrain, train changes meet the vegetation differences and edges. You can find those edges on the map and then go in, get your boots on the ground, check them out. So if you want to check out the Onyx Hunt app, head over to onyxmaps.com, use the coupon code EMW, that'll save yourself 20% off of the Hunt app. The University of Elk Hunting and so Corey Jacobson and Elk 101 have put together the most comprehensive and complete resource for increase, increasing your elk hunting knowledge. And they're doing that through an online course. And for me, I have went through the course from the beginning of it, all four years of hunting elk. I got to learn so much through the 17 different modules and have Anything from the planning stages all the way to when you're packing out the elk at the end and everything in between. It's your one-stop shop to learn elk hunting and plan your own hunt. So if you want to check out the University of Elk Hunting, head over to elk101.com. And if you use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST, you'll get 20% off of a one-year membership. And last but not least, Tethered. So Tethered has evolved from a burning desire to provide quality gear and resources to the saddle hunting community. And what's super important about what I just said there was resources. They're not just trying to sell you gear. They're teaching the community about saddle hunting, the benefits of it, when it's important, how you can add this tool to your tool, your tool bu- uh, bucket for uh for how this episode's going to go and what we're going to talk about. But uh, basically being able to use this to improve uh, your hunting in whatever way. And Tethered does that by just a series of videos and other things to teach you the whole game of saddle hunting. And on top of that, they've designed some saddle-specific gear that is innovative, lightweight, and extremely safe to be able to use. Um, last year I used the predator platform and mantis saddle all season hunting out of it. And this year I'm going to be using the new phantom saddle as well with paired up with the predator platform, extremely lightweight, easy to use. And yes, it is comfortable enough even to sit for all day. So if you want to check out more and learn about saddle hunting as well as check out maybe some of tethered products, head over to tetherednation.com to check that out. All right, so on this week's Mountain Buck Monday story coming to you on Tuesday, I have another story from Jacob McMurray. So this one's coming out of the Western North Carolina mountains. And Jacob wrote, on Friday the 13th in October of 2017, it was a very dreary day with heavy fog and light rain on the mountain. Spooky, right? But I decided to push deeper into this two-year-old cutover. With it being muzzleloader now and no longer archery, I decided to use the terrain and the weather and a long-distance weapon to my advantage. I knew there had to be deer bedded in or around this cutover. I stalked around the ridge looking off into a large part of the cutover and couldn't believe what I saw. I seen his horns and he was bedded. After an hour watching him and thinking of a million different things I could do, I could tell he was starting to win me. So as soon as he got... The, the bend out of his knees, I hit him with the smoke pole. This buck is special to me because before this area was logged, I had a ridge that I killed a good buck on every November, and I had to hunt the area completely different now. 
just let me know that I could get it done no matter what, just adapting to the situation. Awesome story, Jacob. And if everyone wants to go check out the photo of this deer, I have it posted over on the East Meets West social media pages. A beautiful, looks like a 10 point, uh, just a giant mountain buck. And this is Jacob's second submission here. Awesome story. And I really um, want people to send in their stories because I love sharing them, love sharing the photos. Um, definitely want to hear some more from you. All right, so give some updates here. I got a, an interesting story to start this one off here. So over the weekend, I was out, I was taking a trail camera in a new area that I had scouted in the in the spring, but I was coming in a little bit of a different direction. Uh, I wanted to utilize walking some logging roads and some other old gated roads rather than just kind of bushwhacking with how thick as everything has got. Um, and also with it being a pretty heavy rattlesnake area, I just kind of wanted to, to walk the roads a little bit. And so it was going to be a little over a two mile walk back in. And what it ended up finding out was one, it was a lot thicker in even on the road, which was not cleared out in a while. Um, so I was still doing a lot of bushwhacking, but, um, I ran into a mother bear and three cubs on the way in. And they kind of just scurried off um, in a different direction. So I, you know, I went past them and went up, set up my camera, plan on coming back sometime, maybe in the fall, maybe not till after season to check it. But I um, was coming back out and I was probably, I don't know, a, almost a mile from where I ran into the bears to begin with. And I just heard this loud roar and growl sound coming from the left of me. So I, I, it was so thick, I couldn't see. So instantly I drew my pistol and came crashing out was this mother black bear. And she came about 10, 12 yards of me. And I'm just, you know, I just screaming at her to stop. And she stops about 10 yards out. Maybe, actually, I think it's probably even closer and stood up on her hind legs looking at me and, uh, and told her to get out of here. And she got down and she started, took like two steps like she was going to, walk away and then boom starts sprinting right back at me and i screamed again and uh she stopped even a little bit closer this time and this is where, where it got bad where the cubs got scared and sprinted off and the one runs right behind me so at this point i'm in between the mother bear and the cubs and she's ready to bluff charge me twice so i've got my pistol drawn you know honor i'm not going to shoot unless i absolutely have to um and then you know all of a sudden she starts kind of walking away so i just backed up and was heading out the way i was that i was heading back to my truck but just made sure i didn't turn my back on her and she kind of followed me and watched me for about 75 yards and then uh she got back up with her cubs and, and left me alone but man that was a crazy situation i'd never had anything like that happen you know i've run into bears tons of times in the woods and never had much issue like that or that was that was kind of a little bit uh hairy situation but all right so anyways enough of that uh this podcast and this can be a t another two-part one this is two weeks in a row doing two-part podcast and this is with chris derrick of sick of gear and we're talking you know, we're going to talk about the new 2020 whitetail gear and, you know, the, the couple of these products I've worked on with Chris from a field testing standpoint and giving feedback on for multiple years, including the, the one that's going to be on the next episode talking about the new mobile hunting pack, the cargo box. And so I'm really pumped about these episodes. But in addition to just talking about the new gear and the cool stuff that's coming out, I wanted this to really be a, you know, a podcast where you get a learning lesson out of it and help you make educated decisions with your buying. And whether that's sick of gear or somebody else, being able to understand how to build a proper layering system. That's super important. And, you know, it gets talked about a lot on the, the big game Western hunting side of things, but not as much for whitetail. And that's, you know, that's just, that's absurd to me because it's just as important 
to if you want to be able to sit all day in a stand after hiking in, you know, whether it's a hundred yards or two miles, the way you layer and the way you do things is going to immediately impact your level of comfort. So, um, this, I'm really pumped to get, do this episode here with Chris, but, uh, I did want to let everybody know that going to be doing a giveaway. All right. So got the new cargo box from sick of gear, as well as the new redesigned stratus jacket, which you'll hear about both of these in the next couple episodes. But, uh, I'm going to pick two separate winners to win the new cargo box, mobile hunting pack and the stratus jacket. So, I'm going to give you five different ways to win. So you can have up to five entries on this. So uh, don't get confused by that. But I'm going to have a, the first one's going to be through an Instagram post. So if you have Instagram, you can enter this way. And it's going to be going through my personal page. So at bow.martonic. And so what you would have to do um, is follow the instructions over on that Instagram post. And then also going to do another one on Facebook. So this is a separate entry. You can do this for both of them. So there'll be instructions on the East Meets West Outdoors Facebook page for that. And then also leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So if you leave a a rating and review there, you will get an extra entry in to winning the cargo box and the Stratus jacket. And then lastly, the last two is any order placed over at eastmeetswesthunt.com. So any of the apparel items, sticker packs, water bottles, whatever it is, you will get uh, an additional, um, I guess, entry into the into the giveaway. And then lastly, sign up for the email list at eastmeetswesthunt.com, and that will get you another entry into. Uh, winning these awesome new pieces of gear so uh really pumped about that like i said you can you can start doing the the ratings on apple podcasts and place an order sign up email email us now look out for the social media post on the, the instructions there you know thanks to chris and sick of gear for being willing to do that and give back some of these items so I do encourage people to shop at your local dealer, like a Bucks and Bows Archery, where I used to work at down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, or whatever your local dealer is when you're looking for sick of gear. Um, you know, those those guys and girls that work at those pro shops, they really know their stuff. They are there to help you build a system. You know, they're the bread and butter of, of you know, really the, the hunting industry there. So show them some support. If you don't have any local dealers in your area and you're planning on ordering online, um, please use the the link over on my website. So if you click on East, or if you go to eastmeetswesthunt.com slash partners or click on the partners tab and then just click on the SICA logo. Um, So that goes to a special link over to sickagear.com. And I do make a small commission off of any purchase that go through sick of gear by using that link. And uh, I really appreciate the support. Uh, you know, most of the links that are over there, are these coupon codes do directly correlate to helping the, the podcast out and myself. Um, so if you want to show support that way, I would really, really appreciate that. But all right, so let's get into this episode here with Chris, Derek, and Sicky Gear. All right, we're live. Once again, I'm talking through the computer here since I haven't been able to do any in-person podcasts in quite a while, but uh, I'm talking to a good friend of mine and a familiar voice to the podcast, Chris Derrick. How you doing, Chris? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, bud. Yeah, it's it's uh, good to hear from you. We were chatting a little bit on the, the phone here before we started recording, and it was good to catch up. It seems like you, uh, you're you staying busy out there in Montana. We always stay busy. We always find things to do, just like you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, do you want to give a, a little background on yourself um, for those who maybe haven't listened to you in the past or listened to uh, the podcast here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Chris Derrick. I'm the product manager for the Whitetail line. And the way that works at Sitka is we have people that uh, develop uh, products that are all around a certain pursuit. So 
I know you've had John Barclow on and he does a lot of the big game line stuff that's designed for, you know, elk and antelope and, and sheep hunts. Um, and all the product that I build is really centered on the pursuit of whitetail hunting. So that's what my background is. Grew up uh, in the Southeast uh, pursuing deer basically since my early teens and, and, you know, I have a super big passion for whitetail. So that's how I wound up in Montana, uh, d- uh, developing product on the whitetail side. Yeah. And, and I got to, got to meet you now, you know, for, or I don't know how long ago you started working for Sika, but I met you at the first ATA show you were at working for Sika and, and we kind of hit it off there from the beginning, geeking out on gear and, and talking about things. And it's been, it's been really fun to get to work with you throughout the, the these few years here on, on, uh, some of these projects and the, the, the mastermind that you and the guys at sick have come up with. <laughs> well, it doesn't hurt having really good fill testers like you. So <laughs> for people that don't know, <laughs> Bo gets to play with a lot of the gear. I, I start messing with gears before uh, you can get your hands on it and uh, really helps us uh, hone it in and get it refined to where it needs to be. So Yeah, no, that's, it's been, it's been great to get to do that. And really, you know, basically Chris, when he'll send me some products and say, beat it up, you know, do it, you know, use it hard, you know, and tell me what you don't like, be honest with me. And, and that's what I try to do. And I think that's, that's, uh, one of the things that as we've talked about before really kind of sets, you know, sick apart is just the, the amount of testing and the amount of, you know, thought and, and just everything that goes into it. Yeah, I absolutely want from you guys the good, the bad, and the ugly. So stuff that you like, uh, so I know it's good, and then stuff that maybe you need to change. It's, it's ugly. I better really start rethinking <laughs> and uh, start uh, refining things. So yeah, <laughs> that <laughs> that's uh, that's always a fun part of the development process, though. So. And and Bo gets to complain at me, being like, "What were you thinking?" <laughs> that's funny. Or, or when I'm, you know, or if I complain to you, normally when I complain to you about saying something doesn't work right, and in, in the reality, it comes down to me not using the product correctly, and then you show me how I'm supposed to be using it, and then it's like, "Oh, okay." And then somehow you turn the tables on me, and I don't appreciate that, Chris. <laughs> so only sometimes but helps me figure out also uh if, if, if people can't figure it out then you gotta um either make it a little simpler to use or uh provide an exclamation yeah like how explain how to use it so. yeah yeah definitely and so chris if you know you were out here hunting with me last year in pennsylvania and we'll kind of get into you know a lot of the reasoning behind that here a little bit uh, later in the podcast, but essentially it was for doing field testing and getting to try out, you know, some of the the final testing of some of the new gear we're going to talk about that is for the fall 2020 whitetail line. And then also some stuff that we can't talk about. That'll be, you know, even further down the road, some, you know, 2021, 2022 and, beyond which is is crazy to think about but uh yeah i i wanted to really start this off by talking about you know building a system when it comes to whitetails and i i just feel like you know, you know it gets talked about a lot um from a big game side of things the importance of system building and and layering and all the importance of that but from a whitetail side of things, it's just as important in my opinion. And I kind of want to get, you know, your input on that and kind of how you would guide somebody or educate someone on, you know, what they need to look for and, you know, everything when it comes to building a system. So do you want to kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're, you're really 100% right. Because if you, if you think about like what typically happens with whitetail hunting, especially the style that maybe you're doing though, where you're, you're, you can be pretty mobile is you have periods that there's a lot of exertion or where you're moving. And uh, if you generate sweat during that time period, and then you go to the stationary set. And that's the thing about whitetail, you know, from the big game side, 
you might be glassing for a while, uh, but then you can get up and move again if you need to. But if you climb up in the tree stand, you basically committed yourself to being stationary uh, for that hunt. And if you're wet and you're cold or wet and and not being able to move around and generate that heat or use in your body as the heat source, as John likes to say, uh, then uh, you it makes it harder to pump that moisture out of your system. So setting your foundation layers or setting your layering system for whitetail hunting can be really, really important between a, a good hunt where you can pay attention and a bad one. So what I always teach people is, number one, before you even think about like this, these really high end jackets is setting your foundation. Um, and if you don't have like a good synthetic base layer, like a good lightweight base layer, or maybe like a merino base layer that you have in your system, you need to start there. Don't go spending $350 on a, a jacket without setting your foundation. So I either tell people, hey, are you on the synthetic side where you know it's really good at pump, pumping moisture through, or on your merino side, like even if it gets a little wet, um, you know, it's still gonna maintain some of its glow. And so if you have that already in your system, something that's that's a good synthetic base layer or a reno base layer, then maybe you can start to go ahead and focus on. But I, I really strongly encourage people, don't go and just buy like a Stratus or a Fanatic jacket and think you're okay, and then wear your cotton t-shirt under it. Because odds are, uh, you're gonna sweat on your way in the stand, especially if you're wearing that Fanatic jacket into the stand. And if you've got a cotton t-shirt on it, it's never gonna move that moisture out of the system. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's such a, such a good point. I, I, I know when I first uh, got introduced to high level clothing and, and the first time, the first sick of piece I had was a, a Stratus jacket. One, I might've been the original one that was back in, it was an EV one. I think I got it back in 2013 or 14, somewhere in that range. And when I had that jacket, I remember um, and I actually got a pair of the old early season whitetail pants as well. And I was wearing, you know, cotton underwear and a t-shirt essentially, um, underneath my, my, you know, performance apparel and my good, you know, jacket on the outside. And I was, you know, you don't get any of the real benefits out of it. You might get some, but it's not, you're not getting, the the same thing by being able to wick that moisture away and you know pull that moisture away from your skin whereas you know as we know cotton kills and it's just not it's not going to dry it holds odors there's so many different things wrong with with cotton yeah absolutely and the same way if you you know don't put on a good outer layer piece that can make a difference but it doesn't really matter what you build on top of it if your foundation is wrong like just like if you built a house on a sandy foundation, probably not going to be great uh, with what you put on top of it. So um, that's that's really, uh, really important. And then you need to think about like your uh, your insulation layer, stuff that's going to get you from the season. So where you live, uh, you know, how cold nature you are. So one of the things like the next piece that you might want to put into your kit after especially you have a synthetic uh lightweight synthetic or merino uh base layer top is thinking something like what am i going to do for my like insulation layers in between that and in our line we either have like, the fanatic hoodie which is kind of a kind of a channeled fleece if that's the easiest way to do it with uh, kind of a smooth face on the outside or our heavyweight uh three quarters zip top so if you don't want a hood Maybe the Fanatic hoodie with its face mask and everything's not right for you. Uh, and you would go with the heavyweight. And if you're going to add your hood later in, in the system later on, uh, maybe that's not right for you. Or, you know, Fanatic's super popular because it has that face mask uh, and the flip up, you know, the, the hood and the fold over mitts. But want to add one of those into your kit and then think about what you're going to want for your insulation on your bottom. So there's we have a heavyweight bottom. Uh, and then new coming out this year, we have an Equinox Midi pant, which is like a kind of like a Berber uh, high loft fleece on the inside of the pant. Uh, the way I look at it is kind of it's like our heavyweight bottoms, but on steroids. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that will get you further into the season. 
uh, and you can also, you know, wear it into the stand, uh, you know, so that's, that's some of the differences you want to look at. Um, but make sure you're getting one of those uh, layers for your mid, mid layer. And then uh, the next thing you need to look at is for like a lofted insulation piece. And the, the one I really tell people to focus in on the top, I keep it in my kit basically from early, you know, season when the nights start to get a little bit cool to all the way like late season hunting, uh, I lay under my Stratus or my Fanatic or my incinerator, but it's the Celsius MIDI jacket. And this is a, a Primaloff insulation piece uh, with um, that's really lightweight, super packable. And, um, and like I said, you can layer it in. I, I think of it as my season extender. Uh, I can either put it on top of my Fanatic hoodie or I can wear it under my Stratus. And I'm basically going to get an extended amount of days uh, by using that season extender. Yeah, that that piece alone is is definitely I'd say one of my favorite pieces. The Fanatic hoodie is the, the piece I wear on every single hunt, unless it's about eighty degrees. But I, I use that all the time over top of my base. But that Celsius midi, like you said, is always in my pack. Whether it's the bottom of my pack or I'm wearing it. It can be, you know, in those, you know, say early to mid October might be something I put over top of my fanatic hoodie just to kind of take that chill off as as the sun sets. And then, you know, we, we wore it back when it was in the testing phases in Alberta, you know, when it was in the negative uh, temperatures and, and, and really underneath the, the stratus, like that's, that's a very awesome rut setup. And for, for most of, at least from where I'm hunting in the East. And I feel like for most of the Midwest, that is like a, like you said, it truly is a, a season extender and it weighs almost nothing. Yeah. It's super light. Uh, great to just throw in there. And like I said, it's a piece of my kit all year round and, and uh, surprisingly warm for as thin as it is. Um, uh, and then the next piece that, you know, you want a pair of pants, obviously can't walk in in your underpants. Uh, the one that, you know, if you're in the deep south, the ESW is an extremely lightweight pant with venting. Um, the pant that I send most people to uh, that's going to get you through, you know, most area of the country is the Equinox pant. Um, and, you know, that's great pant with cargo pockets. Uh, you can, you know, use it under your outer layers later on that maybe when you want to walk in light like you do uh, though, and then you add your insulation when you get to your stand um, or the fanatic like bib. Uh, I'm going to assume that 80% of the people that are listening to this would be happy with the Equinox pant as their, their pant yeah. uh, to, to wear in for just general use. Yeah. I mean, we, we were doing that, you know, when you were, you were here, you really got to see the, the use out of it, but that's the the same thing. You know, I'll wear those Equinox pants usually over, like if it's, uh, I'm going to say, say a typical November cold front, you come, you got coming through, you know, right around that freezing mark. I may wear either the heavyweight Merino bottoms uh, base layer or the, just the, the core heavyweight and then those Equinox pants and that's breathable enough that you can walk in and you're not going to sweat. Even if you're walking a couple miles, it's not going to, it's not going to really, you know, make you overheat as you're walking in. And then, you know, I'll pack in either the Stratus. For me, I like the Stratus bibs, which as you'll talk about the outer piece there, but something that's an insulation outer piece to, to put over top of it. And that's, that's been a, a really money setup because that those Equinox pants alone will get you through the beginning of the season. And by layering that stuff together, it just keeps pushing you further throughout the season. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and that's one of the good points you bring up is dressing for the commute. So if you got to walk like 500 yards in your stand or a mile in your stand, I, I would recommend if you're going that distance, Maybe you want to take off your fanatic bibs or your stratus bibs, throw them on your pack and walk in dress for your commute. Because if you wear those items into the stand, you're probably going to spontaneously combust, especially with like the fanatic or the incinerator. And uh, and so you got to take the responsibility of getting yourself there without getting yourself overheated so that when you go in the stationary sit, you know, the system's going to move moisture out. Uh, if you make those mistakes, 
but you're going to be more comfortable faster if you plan out how you commute. So I try and go as light as I can into the stand uh, and then layer up when I get either to the bottom of the tree or in the stand. If I'm heading in like 200 yards or 100 yards, I can wear my but those items and vent and do everything and I'm just fine. Um, but if you're doing what you're doing though, or you're running like I don't know, mile, two miles in pack, pack the stuff in. Yeah. Don't you agree? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and yeah, like you said, and there is situations where I'm, I'm only hunting, you know, a hundred to 200 yards off the road. And at that time I'm doing exactly what you said. I might actually remove that Equinox pant layer and just have the heavyweight bottom. And then either the fanatic bibs or the stratus bibs and run, you know, vent it open. But no matter what, like the way, the way I think of it is when I'm walking into the stand, I I almost want to be cold at the beginning of it. You almost want it when you get out of the truck or whatever, or if, if you're changing at the truck, whatever you do, you want to you want to be a little bit chilled. Um, to by the time you get there, you'll feel at a good place, and then normally, and I want to hear your input on this, Chris. And is you know once I get into the stand, I don't I don't just like throw all my stuff on right then while I'm kind of hot. Um, I let myself cool just a little bit. And I start with putting my hat on like a, like a beanie cap to kind of collect that heat while still letting the rest of my body vent. And then I'm slowly, you know, putting on my layers while it's, say it's still dark if it's a morning sit or, you know, usually I'm, I'm thinking of that for a morning sit, but kind of not doing it all at once. So I don't build up, you know, any extra heat, but kind of slowly get your body to regulate the temperature to it. Yeah, I do the same thing. Uh, and. Uh, and, and if I do make a mistake, which does sometimes happen, I feel myself get sweated up. I'll shed those layers when I get up in the stand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every once in a while, like you're, if, especially if you're setting sticks, maybe things don't go quite right on the way up. Uh, you get <laughs> some sort of mess in the tree that you didn't really expect to run into. And you kind of get, you know, you, you kind of stress yourself getting up there and you're like, oh, I had too much on. Get up there. Go ahead and just shed those, and get yourself to get that chill. Move some of the moisture out, and then go ahead and put your you know puffy or your outer layer on. And then, you know, that's where we get into like the outer layers. I tell people like either depending on where you are, most of the country like the stratus is a super versatile piece. And if you layer uh, like the Celsius midi or your heavyweight bottom under the stratus you're going to get into the twenties and the teens, you know, if it's like morning teens and teens and going to warm up a little bit, or if it's just going to sit in the twenties all day, with the proper insulation under the stratus, you're probably fine depending on how cold natured you are. Um, and so that's stratus is like a micro fleece face, uh, a wind stopper laminate. So basically it's going to be super breathable, but it's going to stop the wind uh, from sapping the heat away from you. And we redesigned that for this year. So the Stratus jacket now has um, the constant connect safety harness port. So if you're running like the traditional shoulder mount uh, tethered tethered design, like where the, the safety harness comes off the back of your neck, you can don and doff your jacket or take on and off your jacket without ever disconnecting your safety harness from the tree stand. So that's if you're running the traditional format. If you're running like a saddle, like a like a tethered saddle like you run, you know, you won't even know it's there. You won't have to use the feature. But, you know, a good portion of the market, at least sometimes of the year, isn't always hunting out of a saddle. Mm-hmm. And in that case, having a shoulder mounted t- t- tether like a muddy or a hunter safety systems, you know, those are all shoulder mounted. And those ones, you want to be able to take your jacket off without disconnecting from the tree if you can inside the stand uh, while you're 30 feet up in the air. Cause I I've known somebody that's fallen out and broken their neck and trust me, you don't want to sit for six months <laughs> in traction uh, while you heal a broken neck. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's so true. And, and it's, it's those times when you would disconnect for a second where you're really the most vulnerable, you know, that, you know, where things could happen, you could slip, you never know, you know, you might go a whole life without having any issues, but 
the I, I don't know I don't like to leave that to chance and I like the idea of being able to stay tied off all the time and you know and I, I do and or just as of last year you know run a saddle most of the time but there's even even for myself there's situations whether that's like in a hemlock tree or a pine tree where I'm running a traditional tree stand or just depending on the, what the situation is I might be running a tree stand and at that case that feature has been and awesome, which was introduced in the Fanatic jacket for the launch of last year, wasn't it? It was, and yeah, that's something that uh, that I've been working on for for a while, and we have a patent going on it. Um, so that you know, that's something that's a unique feature that we really want to build in, and I'm I've been super passionate about. Um, and then another, since we're on the Stratus, I might as well go into what's new about it since it's new for 2020. Um, I did a project, if you remember from the Fanatic, James Black, the acoustic engineer we worked with out here at Montana State University. He's the guy that, like, if you go in a concert venue or an office building, he makes the acoustics work in that type of room. So he'll go in and, like, advise on what happens. Um, and so with James, what we did is he and I worked together on um, analyzing the noise of, like, the frequency that, like, a a hoof might make in dry leaves. Um, and then the other thing that like gore has, you don't know this. A lot of you don't know this, but like there's gore material, in, like the, the headlights of your car and in your iPhone, the reason you can drop your iPhone or, or any, a lot of different phones uh, into the water is because they'll have like a, a, a gore style laminate in those. And that, so when the phone heats up, it lets vapor out. But if you have water going, it can't go inside the phone. So there's this group at Gore that I found that their whole job is like understanding end user hearing. So they have what's this 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 head. It's kind of the same style of head that might go in a BMW if you're like running down the road and they want to see how quiet the cab is. Um, we took one of those uh, acoustic heads. It's called a, a head and torso simulator or it's like known as Mr. Hats is kind of the code name for him. Uh, it's kind of a fun name for him. <laughs> but we could put all of these different hood designs with different textiles and different insulation packages over the ears and figure out which ones were the most acoustically transparent. So we'd use this white noise to be able to measure what basically would be the acoustic loss or the insertion loss. And then uh, we were able to take that back and James was able to to apply it into essentially an algorithm that would be able to measure both the frequency, the, 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 the type of leaves we measured crushing and how that would um, uh, dissipate sound over time uh, with the number of dec decibels that you lose for every distance you double, you lose six decibels. And so essentially what, what all that means is the new Stratus hood allows you to hear four times as far as the old Stratus hood. So if you could maybe hear a deer with a hood on, you've all put on hoods and you're like, crap, I can't hear anything around me. Uh, I'm sure almost every whitetail hunter has had that. Um, these ones, like maybe if the old hood, you could only hear a deer at 20 yards. You could technically hear it at 80 yards, most likely, or at the same distance. So you could hear a sound at 40 yards. You'd be able to hear that sound three times as loud at that distance too so it really gives you a just a chance if you're wearing a hood for protection allows you to be able to get maybe that extra 30 seconds you need to turn your body get set for the deer to come in because sometimes i'm sure we've all had it there's a deer standing right beside you and they're very cute in the movement and you don't feel very comfortable making the move to get your shot angle and all of a sudden they're there for a minute I know you are still haunted by one in uh, <laughs> uh, Alberta. Yeah. Uh, and in that case, you know, you might have had that extra 30 seconds to turn and get yourself ready and prepared for the shot. Yeah. And and that, um, to speak uh, on that, you know, from using this, this new Stratus system and with that hood, you know, I, I have been a person that didn't like to wear hoods besides like something light, like say the fanatic hoodie, you know, I like wearing that. Um, but I, I wouldn't wear an outer hood. I'd actually take it off. Um, most jackets or wear a jacket that didn't have one because I, I just didn't find a use for it because 
I, I didn't like not being able to hear with it, where there's a couple different things with this Stratus jacket that that made me be able to use that. One is the, the be able to hear, and also, and this might have been in the other jacket, I can't remember, but the angle of it um, gives you that peripheral view as well. So you still got your sight, which sometimes you tend to lose with you know a typical hood, and you got the hearing, but being able to add that wind stopper to your head there just really helps out with keeping that warmth in. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that can make a big difference. And so on windy days, I, a lot of times I'll take the hood is removable. Uh, if you don't want it, you can take it off. Uh, and then like there's days it's nice to have it on there when it's windy, uh, and you can flip it up and you really don't lose very much, um, ability to be able to hear. I I've really enjoyed that. That's the first time I'll actually wear a hood. Uh, in the field. And so uh, that's, that's something that's really nice. And the beanie, the new Stratus beanie for this year also incorporates that. And we use uh, a double layer of uh, polar tech alpha insulation in the hearing ports as well. So there's, there's insulation. Um, it's an extremely acoustically transparent mesh uh, uh, that we use to as well. And then that uh, specialized insulation in there as well. Is the the Polar Tech Alpha, is that what's in the, from the big game side, the Kelvin Active Jacket? Yep, the Kelvin Active Hoodie uh, it has something uh, very similar. It's not the exact same insulation, uh, but yeah, that's that's essentially what you're looking at. So okay. if you've seen it, it's very breathable, kind of like, uh, I won't call it, it's not Burberry, but you know, I'm trying to explain it for people <laughs> that are, haven't but that it's that style of design super light super breathable yeah um great warmth but um allows a lot of airflow when you need it so and and i don't know uh, about everyone listening but for me you know i never liked to wear beanies same thing as i talked about the hoods that I'd, I'd either kind of fold them up around my ear or i'd put them just over the top of my ear which you run the you know the kind of risk like so say like in alberta where we were up there it was super cold and you had some wind blowing and stuff you needed to be able to hear but you know if you're blowing and hitting the side you know the bottom of your ears would turn super red and everything where now you're you're literally able to wear that hat like it's meant to be worn and pull it down over your ears and you, and you can hear and that you know i was pretty skeptical with that because i've never found a hat where you can <laughs> hear through it and it's it is it is a lot different you know you can feel it's just it's visibly you know a little bit thinner and it just feels it's well it's, it, you can see it from the the different material that's there yeah we built a little bit deeper scoop so we do now that we had the hearing ports in it we could actually scoop and cover your whole ear and allow you to hear better than the old beanie but then what's nice about those scoops, too, is if you want to roll them up, uh, they they roll up very nicely uh, above your ears. So uh, if you want to take it on and off, you can still do that. And it actually works a little bit better than the old beanie, in my opinion, uh, with kind of the scoop design around the ear. Yeah, think of it um, almost like it, uh, like almost like a the bottom piece of a football helmet or, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's the right way to explain it, but just like a little round lobe that kind of hangs down and you can fold that up yeah yeah that's a good way to do it and the fanatic beanie this year is new and it's also uh been redesigned with those hearing ports and that fanatic beanie also has a four times uh distance improvement over the old fanatic beanie so um that's that's really a key thing if you're wearing beanies now you can keep your your ears warm you don't have to deal with the old up flip one ear up flip one down you know do it as long as you can until the pain subsides you know, you can fold them down if it's cold and you're going to be able to hear really well. Yeah. So while we're, while we're on the topic still, let's, let's talk, you know, some more about the Stratus, um, system here before we move on to more of the building the layering, but the Stratus also has, uh, a feature that, that, uh, you and I had some fun with here in November, the, the new grunt tube holder. Yeah. Uh, we put this, this is actually a dot. You, Rich, Rick is the guy that uh, essentially suggested this, who I knew you used to work with. Yeah, Rick at the Maxson. Shop. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, so he called and he was like, man, you're, you have like all these great grunt tube features on the Fanatic and you're running in the Stratus and you don't have any really thing that's 
there that can hold a grunt tube uh, for, you know, when I'm going to be wearing this thing during the run. And I was like, you know what, you're, you're right. So what we essentially worked on was developing a special sleeve that sits on the shoulder. Um, and uh, that sleeve allows you to keep your grunt tube kind of like on your left shoulder. Um, and what I like about this feature is you can, um, you, while you're at full draw, uh, you know, just practice this a couple of times. But when you're at full draw, you can reach over and actually grunt the tube while at full draw. And so if you want to stop a buck and maybe you're not somebody that's comfortable, you know, doing the bleat yourself or, or like, you know, simulating a grunt, you can do that. Um, and, you know, it keeps it just right there and handy. Uh, so that's, that's something that we built into this just because we knew a lot of, uh, folks would be wearing this product, uh, during the, um, during the rut. Yeah. It's, um, that, that feature is, is funny. Cause when it, when you first showed me, it, I kind of looked at it like, I don't think I'm going to use this. It just didn't seem like it was going to work. But once I put my grunt tube in there and played with it, like it, it works, it's right there. So if you're. Um, so you're able to like basically lean over and you don't even have to pull your head too much, you know, off your bow, just over your shoulder grunt. You can stop a deer or I just left it in there while I was sitting in the tree and I would just grunt that way without, you know, pulling it out at all. I got so comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good way to do it. And then, you know, when I was there, I was trying all those different grunt tubes and I had one that I thought I liked. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I stuck it in there while we were filming. I reached over and it like had slid like the reed down. And when I did it, it was like, what? <laughs> I swear, I didn't think you guys, you and Dan were ever going to stop laughing. So, oh, uh, we, we need Dan to pull that footage and somehow get a hold of it because that was, that was funny. It was like a, if there was, if there was any buck in, in the woods, I, I, yeah, I don't know what they would have done if they heard that. <laughs> I don't think you can play it because I think I I, I dropped a, a probably an S bomb. I think I just looked at him and was like, I hate this shit too. Oh man, just, uh, this is all the time of laughing. So yeah. Oh, that made so, for that made anyway, for the good rest of the week at camp. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we would just buy all of a sudden somebody would just uh, just spout off with that noise and everybody would just start laughing. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, so is there anything else with the, the Stratus that, that you want to mention here? Uh, the only thing is uh, it, we do have it now in Blaze. So if you want not just to wear like a regular Blaze vest, uh, you can actually have your vest have wind stopper protection in it. So now the Stratus vest is in Blaze. And then if maybe you're living in a place like Wisconsin where you want like a full Blaze jacket, uh, there's actual Stratus jacket is available in a full blaze sleeves, everything. Uh, so th- that is available for, uh, that's new for this year. Is the, is the Stratus vest updated? Like the, the actual elevated two one as well. It is. You have the EV two ones. So you can get it in either elevated two or you can get it in blaze. Okay. Both and the, the jacket and, and the vest. And that has the grunt tube holder access on it too, right? Because I, I have the Blaze one, and I'm pretty sure that had the, the grunt tube holder. It does, yeah. It's a, it'll be a solid gray on the uh, kind of an accent color on the uh, the Blaze one, and then um, uh, and then a matching color on the Stratus, on the elevated tube one. So it's full concealment then. Gotcha. Okay, um, so let's let's jump back a little bit, Chris. Let's go as we were talking about the the outer layers. Talk about like the difference um, um, in outer layers and kind of the importance of it and what it's you know kind of built for. Yeah, so you know from Stratus, like I said, a lot of most everybody that's listening to this podcast will be able to use the Stratus. Uh, you know, unless you're super super cold natured, um, and. So the, the Stratus, you know, gives you your wind opera, you can layer insulation under it. Um, but let's say you're, you're extremely cold natured uh, or you're, li- you're living where it's like a kind of a wet cold or, or super dry cold, but you're, you're in sub zero temperatures, zero temperatures. Then you need to start looking at the difference between maybe the fanatic or the incinerator. So the way that I work at it for this is 
if you're someone that's in ultra cold conditions and quiet is all that matters to you, you want to be ultra quiet. You're, you're looking for ways to be extremely quiet. And it's usually a dry cold, uh, other than just a little bit of misting rain here. It's mostly snow. Uh, that would be the fanatic. That's the one that I would say, this is your ultra cold weather decision uh, for when it's frigid, uh, usually a, a dry cold, which is the snow or, or light misting rain, you'll be fine with it uh, as long as you have access to a dryer. Um, but let's say that you're living, you're somewhere that it's like a really wet snow, or let's say you live in like the South and a lot of times you're hunting in like the rain and everybody knows like, 35 degrees and rain is probably worse feeling than 20 degrees and dry any day of the week. It's just like right, right at those temperatures. And for those, like if it's a wet cold incinerator is a really good fit. So I'd say like, look at the number of days you're hunting in those type of conditions and what you're normally facing. And if you're going to go down the wet cold, uh, you know, route, uh, that incinerator might be a better fit for you. And if you're going to go the dry, quiet route, that's really important. Go to the fanatic. Uh, but that's what I would just encourage people to take a look at between those two systems to find the one that's right for them for those cold days. Yeah. I mean, so that, that's a question I think from working, you know, when I worked at Bucks and Bows as a SICA dealer, um, and then even just now getting messages about it is okay, why? Is the fanatic, you know, a four hundred dollar jacket and doesn't have Gore Tex in it? And my answer has been, and I want to hear yours, Chris, is you know, when for the times you're wearing the the fanatic jacket, say being if you're hunting in the north and the Midwest where you're normally it's going to be below freezing and you're going to have snow, and at that point you're not going to have any issue. You really don't need that full Gore-Tex where the windstopper, the, the laminate there still is highly water resistant. I mean, the Berber definitely holds, you know, some moisture and stuff there, but as like you said, if you have access to a dryer at night, you can dry your clothes. It'll just be wet on the outside. And I've, I've actually been through rain in the fanatic and I've never gotten wet underneath. It's just that your clothes are a lot heavier coming out. Um, but like you said, but that's where you, the, with the the Berber and stuff, that's what makes it quiet, where if you were on a, a full Gore-Tex piece, you, Gore-Tex piece, you probably wouldn't be able to get that that quietness that you get out of the Fanatic. Is that is that somewhere along yeah. the line? Yeah, and we're still using the quietest Gore-Tex we can in the incinerator, but you're exactly right. Like, I've worn the Fanatic in kind of like an off-and-on, all-day misty rain, and I've never got wet. You know, I've been totally fine. Um, but there, you know, there's something to be said too. If you're like living in the South and it's never snowing, there's always leaves on the tree. Maybe like the super quiet thing is it super important. You usually hunt with a gun. So you're usually going to have a, you know, like if you're a rifle hunter, the incinerator may be perfect for you because you don't need a whole lot of time to get ready. Right. It's a whole different ordeal when you've got a rifle, uh, usually to be able to get around on an animal and be able to take the shot you need. Um, and so like the incinerator is a great, great piece for that. Um, and cold is really relative too. like the way I look at it is like, I know guys that are in Florida, like if it's 40 degrees out, they look like they're dressed like a guy from the Midwest when it's zero. It's, you know, it's yeah. like, even when I, I'm back here, like if, if I spend time, like my parents come visit me in Montana, they look like you know, they're Eskimos yeah. and cause they, they live in Georgia and they're, they're thin, thin blood. Um, and so that's, that's, it's just where you live. But like, if I go back home now and I have to sit in 90 degree heat in July or a hundred degree, like I look like I'm wilting away and they're just fine. <laughs> so <laughs> my body is adjusted to the climate here in Montana. So that's, that's just one of the things is think about where you live and what you're going to be facing in your hunting conditions. And that should really drive your decision. You know, not the one day you're going to be going hunting. Uh, think about all the other days that, that maybe you need it for that one piece. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And that's, and so to kind of go back to the, the Stratus system and this is a piece, I mean, if I was going to say, 
you know, if you have a good foundation and everything there and you're looking for an outer layer piece that's going to get you the furthest, I mean, the Stratus is definitely it. I mean, that's the piece that I wear more than anything. And, you know, with it being windstopper, it's not a full Gore-Tex, so it's not, you know, 100% waterproof. But the same thing is, I don't think I can ever remember a time where I was like wet, even, and I've sat in rain in the Stratus. I mean, some pretty good rain. It, uh, like I said, the outside will be wet. It'll feel heavier because with the, um, with the, I guess, is it the microgrid fleece? I'm not sure the technical term for it, but, uh, the micro fleece that's on the outside, you know, that, that can hold a little bit of water, but I'm not getting wet on the inside. And that's the, the important part for, for me anyways. Yeah. And your body will drive that, you know, a lot of that wet off, but you'll feel that evaporative cooling too. Uh, so that's what we talk about, wet pickup and things like that. Like, you know, those are some of the, the things, but you're not going to be soaked on the inside. Yes. Um, so it's just thinking about how you're doing that because your your body's going to be pumping heat away, you know, and it's going to be rising, rising it through. And that's that's really important. Um, so and then, um, you know, from a Gore-Tex standpoint, too, we do have the downpour system and that's, you know, no insulation, just Gore-Tex, you know, so early season rain, mid season rain, you know, that's fine for that, you know, uh, those types of conditions. So those are really your outdoor pieces, Stratus fanatic incinerator, uh, for cooler conditions. And then downpour is the, um, the true rainwear piece, uh, with no insulation. Yeah. All right. So Chris, I want to, I want to give you a scenario here and I want you to give an example of this. So one of the, 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 probably the majority of the questions I get is, okay, what kind of system are you building for hunting the first week of November, say in the, the Midwest or the East, or like when you came to, to visit me in here in Pennsylvania? And I, and I understand like this is going to shift a little bit for everybody, but what's kind of your go-to system there? Say temperatures anywhere from high 20s in the morning, maybe up to like say 40 in the afternoon. Yep. Uh, so my system would be um, core lightweight uh, base layer, uh, which like the core lightweight top, or uh, um, or the merino uh, heavyweight. Uh, one of those two base layers would either of those is fine uh, if you have those in your kit. And then I would wear for my mid layer. Uh, I would have a heavyweight bottom, uh, and then either a fanatic hoodie or a heavyweight hoodie uh, or excuse me, a heavyweight 15. Those are the two things. So let's think if I was going to go down the full synthetic, I would go core lightweight, uh, long sleeve. Uh, I would go uh, heavyweight zip T. Uh, I would go with a heavyweight bottom or the Merino heavyweight bottom. Um, and then for my insulation package, I would have my Celsius midi. An Equinox pant for walking in. And then I would have a Stratus jacket and a Stratus bib. And that's that would basically get me down into those, if it was like 20 degrees in the morning and, uh, you know, and then getting up to freezing in the day, I'd be just fine with that. Um, and then, you know, I would obviously have my Stratus beanie with me. Uh, and then I would have probably a Fanatic glove. And, um, and then if it's a really cold time, I might have my incinerator muff Mm -hmm. or an incinerator flip mitt for, for my glove. Yep. Um, and then I would have a pack. Gotcha. So, um, so I, I think we've hung out a lot around each other. So our systems are very, very similar. Um, and you know, I, I think that like, you know, if someone wanted like the one base layer for them, you can't go wrong with the core lightweight, you know, long sleeve, core lightweight, it, one base layer. it's just, yeah, that's your one base layer. If you want to, um, you know, ex- say really fine tune that system, I've really come to like that Merino heavyweight and wear that against the skin almost all the time in, uh, in the rut and, and just, I, I don't know. I've just really come to like that with that, that the polyester that's kind of against your skin and then the Merino on top of that. Is that the way that's kind of laid out? 
Yeah, if you want to think about it, it's it's not exactly the the warm to glow value, but it's pretty similar. If you were to think of the core lightweight synthetic with a fanatic hoodie on top of it or a heavyweight zip tee on top of it, that's essentially the merino heavyweight because you've got a poly synthetic layer against your skin, and then you've got merino. That the only difference is merino instead of a, the the fleece that that is in the uh, fanatic hoodie, but that that essentially is going to be what you have. So that poly layer doesn't like the moisture. It's going to push it away from your body. The merino is going to want want that moisture more uh, and pull it off. So you basically aren't going to get a clammy feeling that you get with just wearing like normal wool against your skin. Yeah. And so so I so either one of those two, but say say I was going to do the 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 merino heavyweight just for talking senses here. Then I, I like the fanatic hoodie over top of that, and th- then for a bottom, I've been really liking the merino heavyweight bottoms over top of either like the the core um, the underwear there or the merino um, bottoms or the merino underwear, and. Then um, on top of that, I'd have the Equinox pant. Cause, so that's what my walk-in system looks like, just what I'm wearing there to get into my stand. Then over that, I'm usually packing in the, the Stratus bibs, throwing those on, and then the Stratus jacket. If it's feeling kind of colder there in the morning, I'll throw that Celsius midi on underneath. Um, or a system that I've used for, for just until last year, I started really using that midi. But um, before that, which has been a really effective system, and I, I like um, using this is wearing the Stratus over the Fanatic uh, hoodie and then using the Fanatic vest. So the Fanatic vest gives you that that muff feature in the front for your hands and then also gives you the, the range finder pocket, the grunt tube holder that's all in there and gives you that loft and that insulation around your core when you need it. And that gets you through so much of the season. Um, like I said, last year, I've been, I just didn't use that as much because I was using the MIDI underneath the Stratus. Um, but uh, that that system with that Fanatic vest is killer. I mean, that using being able to use that hand muff that's built in is just the softest, warmest thing. Like, I can't even explain it unless you've felt it. It's, it's, it's a great feature to have in there. It was this material made by heaven, I think, but it is, uh, uh, it, 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 and I, I do love that about the fanatic vest and you're so right about that because I, it, the great thing about it is the muffs always with you, right? Yeah. You don't have to strap on a separate muff to, to wear the muffs built right in the jacket and it's super low profile. Mm-hmm. So, and we all like to rest our hands somewhere usually when we're standing or sitting and it's like right there, always in the jacket. So super, super important. Um, yeah, like the, the Fanatic, if you already own the Stratus and you don't want to spend the money on the Fanatic jacket, the Fanatic vest is a great add-on uh, to get you very deep into your season where you can get that muff and get a little bit more versatility out of your system. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's a great recommendation. Yeah, for sure. And, and one thing I would say, if any of you that are running a saddle – Um, that, that muff feature in the fanatic vest will work. Um, it's a little, it's not as easy as it is in a tree stand that you have to keep your hands up a little bit higher. Um, and if that bugs you at all, then, then adding on the, the incinerator muff might be, and I think that's what I might try this year when I'm running the Stratus is that incinerator muff, um, to be able to have that below where your tether goes up. So that's just a, um, a thought process there when running a saddle as things are a little bit different. Yeah, I've done that with that little piece on the tethered um, saddles where I set the muff right on top yeah. Um, so I can keep my hands up or set it in between the two. And I normally kind of scoot my saddle down. But after, you know, saddle hunting, you know, if you're doing the mobile thing, man, there's just nothing better in the world yeah. uh, for going in and setting up tree stands like <laughs> on the move. Uh, that's I, I, I have totally... Uh, just think that's just an unbelievable system that they're doing. So yeah, you um you did you jumped into the saddle game um as like get thrown into the flames as much as possible because the first you know you just started using it when you were here in Pennsylvania and uh, you killed a buck out of it in like three days. So out of like off your I did. Week, off your weak side, like the hardest shot out of a saddle, you did it basically without 
really any time to practice beforehand. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I didn't. Uh, and I really wanted to understand what it was all about because I told, you know, Greg and them, I, I was kind of skeptical. I wasn't sure. And uh, so I went in, I was like, mm. and then after using it, I'm like, dude, I'm on board. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think it's a lot of fun. So, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's so like going in. So it, 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 there's for anybody that's wondering about it, if you're doing the, like, if you're hunting at like a club and your stands are all set up and you're not moving a lot, no need. But I, I'm telling you, if you're on the move, I, I don't think there's a better way to do it. And especially with the now eighters on the, the sticks where you can, you know, only carry like three of them in or two of them. In. Yeah. It, it, it's, what a difference so yeah yeah i got i gotta show you those ones those new sticks i got that i I was telling you about those timber ninja ones carbon fiber man when you see those you're gonna be my whole setup with four sticks and the platform weighs eight pounds like that's enough it's unbelievable i can get 16 18 feet in the air and it's absolutely incredible to to do that but um anyways (laughs) <laughs> that's a that's a whole nother topic there um but what i wanted to um dive into some more here chris and, and thanks for going through building a system there i think that uh, should help people be able to kind of figure out their route from sicka standpoint but also this is just knowledge in general about building a system that can be used in any aspect and and you know isn't just specific to this well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate you coming on again and for your, I don't know, fourth or fifth episode that you've been on the podcast here. So I think, I think, I think you're going to retire. I think I'm done talking to you. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> uh, just kidding. You're, you're always, always welcome on the talk. And, and like I said, thanks for educating everyone on, on building the system and some of the new products. Well, thanks everyone for your support. All right, we'll see you, Chris. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.